And so I, I'd now like to introduce Robert Beltron, who will give you an inside look at Clifford Odette's The Big Knife. Thank you. Um, the play, The Big Knife, uh, has become, uh, was now less of an obsession, but was quite an obsession with me. And um, I felt that I had to get some actors together to produce the play and, and do it. And I was lucky to get a very good cast together and a very good director. And um, we got to work on, on the play. We started rehearsals. And in the rehearsal process, I was playing Charlie Castle, who's the central character in the play. In the process of rehearsal, several times Charlie hears the doves outside of his window of his house, his, his house in Beverly Hills, and it wakes him up. He can't get a good night's sleep. And several times in the play, he mimics the sound of the doves that he hears. And um, there's a scene where he's having, with his, he's having with his agent and he hears the doves in the middle of their conversation. He says, those damn doves, those mourning doves. Mourning, M-O-U-R, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Those mourning doves, they woke me up again this morning. He hasn't been able to sleep. And he mimics the sound of the doves. He's, he goes, uh, I have them outside my house uh, too, so I know it, I know it quite well. Uh, <laughs> he says... Um, Mimicking the doves, he says, hoo, 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 hoo. And uh, he has to do this three times in the play. So uh, my director, once when we were rehearsing this, these scenes, uh, had the disconcerting habit of coming up to you and saying, um, what's that really about? <laughs> and... Uh, I, I said, well, it's morning doves, you know, morning doves. It's, they're grieving. They're grie grieving over Charlie Castle. They're, they see that he's dying. And he just looked at me and says, is that all? <laughs> said, well, uh, so a few days later, <laughs> a few days later, I'm still rehearsing these scenes, and I have to do that sound, right, in the middle of the scene. And he comes up to me after, the, after we had run through the scene a couple of times. He goes, Robert, um, what, what is that? What, what, what do you think that is? And I wanted to scream. I said, damn it, it's the morning doves. They're mourning for, <laughs> don't you get it? They're mourning for Charlie Castle. <laughs> so I said, that's what I said to him again. He said, is that all? Is that all? <laughs> so the next couple of days we were rehearsing and then uh, one morning he came in to our rehearsal smiling and he says Robert have you looked at how Odette spells the hoo 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 and I said yeah yeah he said have you really looked at it and I said yeah he says well look and so he showed it to me it spelled O O hoo O O hoo W H O O O O O W H O So we both smiled very broadly and said, Yes, that's it. Who? Who? That is what's waking Charlie Castle up. That's why he can't get to sleep. The morning doves, all those billions of morning doves are waking up him up out of his sleep. Who? 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 
And if you take the question <clears throat> further, the question is, who are you really? Who? Who are you really, Charlie Castle? Who have you become? Who were you? And who have you become? Who are you really? And then later, the big question is, who, if not you? Who, if not you? So this, of course, um, opened up the whole, the whole play for me, really, and um, the character of Charlie. Um, he's got everything. He's a fabulously wealthy, successful movie star, money, fame, all the luxuries of success, but he's miserable. And his wife is miserable. Their marriage is in shambles. And during the course of the play, we find out why. How did this happen? Um, we know that in the end, he commits suicide. And his journey through this play is to get to the point where he gets he has no other choice, as far as he can see, but to kill himself. And just before, in the last scene, just before he does that, he comes to a great realization of who he has become. And the reality of it is what tips him over into committing suicide. And he has a very simple line. After all the stuff has come down, all the the conflict with his studio boss and with his wife and everything. He finally comes to the realization and he says, now I realize what I am. And shortly after that, he goes upstairs to commit suicide. So what I want to do is sort of track Charlie's journey, how he got to that point. Who he was and the great promise of who he was who he's become, who he will never be, because he never gives him th himself the chance to change. Um, in the opening scene, Harley mentioned it briefly, he's having a, a, a scene with his, his friend, whose name is Buddy, who's also a publicity agent at the studio. It's a, the, the, one of the big studios in Hollywood at the time, and a famous gossip columnist. And as uh, <clears throat> Odette describes this, this go gossip columnist, um, her name is Patty Benedict, and he describes her as a famous movie columnist. She is authoritative, cynical, and assured, insolently appraising. The world of Hollywood is surely her intimidated oyster. So, at the beginning of the play, before the first words, a couple of things have happened. A year and a half before, Charlie Castle was coming home from a Christmas Eve party at the studio with a young starlet that he was having an affair with, and he was drunk, and he accidentally ran over and killed a child. So. The studio boss had to be called in. His agent had to be called in. The studio boss's right-hand man, who was sort of the uh, uh, Carl Rove of the studio, um, <laughs> comes in. And they, they had to plan to have Charlie's friend, Buddy, his friend, Buddy, take the rap for him. And Buddy goes along with it. He goes to jail for, Buddy, for, for Charlie for 10 months. This is the event that happens before the play starts. Um, just, before the, just before the first line, Charlie comes in. Buddy's <coughs> Buddy, the publicity uh, person who, who's from the studio, is pacing back and forth because there's been a little tiff between Patty Benedict and Charlie. So she's come in the house. Charlie follows after her, uh, shortly after her. He sees Buddy, he doesn't see Patty, and he says, where's Patty? And Buddy says, powdering her nose. Why are you so pale, Bud? You take this so big? I work for the studio, Charles. You're a big star. I'm supposed to keep you out of trouble. 
Well, that doesn't give her the right to insult me at my own lunch table, bud. She keeps coming at me with those great big lobster claws, and Mr. Castle, he don't like it. All I'm trying to do is ease the situation. As an old friend, if you don't mind my saying so, you can't talk that way to Patty Benedict. Hell, Charles, 18 million people read her column every day. For the love of Pete, take it easy till I get her out of here. Did you hear that stuff she started about my wife? She was edging up all through the lunch. What about the separation rumors? I could hear it clicking in her head like knitting needles. I'll have her out of here in five minutes flat. What a life you publicity men lead. It makes me wonder if I was being friendly when I got you the job. And Buddy says, what a guy. After all you've done for me. Uh, this is the guy who took the rap for, for Charlie. And Charlie says, I think, Bud, the shoe's on the other foot. Uh-oh, put the leash around my neck. Here comes malignant Maggie. Patty, darling, quench your thirst. And Patty comes in. Like my cigarette, Chuck. <laughs> Thanks. What is that, the radio? No, it's a record. A love scene from a fancy Beethoven opera. Shut the damn thing off. It's a hot and lazy afternoon, cool in here. Who wants what from the lemonade stand? I like the airiness of this room. French paintings, dear one? Yeah. Don't you buy American anymore? Let nothing you dismay, little chum. I don't know one painter from another. And Buddy, who's trying to be helpful, says, he doesn't know one painter from another. And Charlie says, I wouldn't want my fans saying I've gone arty, would I? They're my wife's hobby. Buddy says, Marion's hobby. And Patty says, how long do I know you, Chuck? A fat nine or ten years. The first time we met, all you'd talk about was FDR. I believed in FDR. I still need an angle for my Sunday piece. What do you believe in now? What we had for lunch, roast beef, rare. You're a lot smarter than you used to be. I had to learn, Patricia. Buddy says, Charlie Slogan, if you got a message, send for Western Union. <laughs> Patty says, well, here's the afternoon burnt to a crisp and still no Sunday peace. How is your new picture? Any good? I wouldn't kid you, Patty. Another armful of roses and a basket of kittens. Anything on your new contract yet? No. Marcus Hoff told me last week that you were about to re-sign. Marcus Hoff is the head of the studio. That you were about to re-sign. He's the head of the studio, isn't he? It doesn't cost him anything to dream. Are you and Marcus feuding? Now, darling, why would I feud with Uncle Hoff? And Buddy says, Mr. Hoff has always been more like a father to Charles. <laughs> Patty says, I'm trying to remember your real name. Cress? And Buddy says, Cass. Charles Cass. Charlie says, I hooked my stage name from an uncle. His name was Schloss. Castle in German. What made you honor your uncle to that high degree? He merely raised me after my parents died. And Buddy says, in Philly, wasn't it? Philadelphia, yep. They were awfully poor, my aunt and uncle. I made money too late to be able to help them. I regret that. <sighs> we're homesick all our lives, but adults don't talk about it, do they? And then to change the subject, because Patty is not very re receptive to any real kind of conversation, uh, <laughs> Charlie says, Buddy, did you read much as a kid? And Buddy says, as a kid? Not unless they hit me with a whip. And Charlie says, my uncle's books. For that neighborhood, I'll bet he had a thousand. He had a nose for the rebels, London, Upton Sinclair, all the way back to Ibsen and Hugo. Hugo's the one who helped me nibble my way through billions of poly seeds. Sounds grandiose, but Hugo said to me, be a good boy, Charlie. Love people. Do good. Help the lost and fallen. Make the world happy if you can. And Patty laughs in his face. And Charlie says, I know, before you say it, dear, too fruity, I buy it all back. And Patty says, now let me have the truth, Chuck, about, before I go, about the separation rumors. Charlie says, that patty cake, she's always trying to tag me. Get out of that jury box, darling. There's no basis in fact for the rumors. Marion has the kid at the beach because of the polio scare. Chuck, I don't think I'd ever forgive you if someone else published your divorce story before I did. I hope you understand that. 
And Buddy says, he understands that. And now she's upping the ante because she's not getting what, he, what she wants. So she says, what about her politics, your wife's? And here Charlie starts to lose his temper. Politics, that's another nasty rumor. Maybe Marion gave them some campaign money. And then he thinks twice about what he just says, just said. And he says, but she didn't, so far as I know. And Buddy says, what Charles is trying to say, Marion comes from fine old American stock. And Charlie says, they got here with the cricket and the mouse. Buddy says, her father's history books are read in every college in the land. And Charlie says, and anyway, that's her right. And Patty says, what's her right? Buddy says, Patty, what Charles means by that. And she says, shut up for five minutes. I want my gossip from the horse's mouth, not its tail. <laughs> and Charlie says, come on, Patty, you know it's his living. Let's be democratic. Mix yourself a drink, bud. And Patty says, you're just too itsy bitsy coy for me today. And while we're on the subject, why did the studio give him back his job? And Charlie says, Buddy's a first-rate publicity man. He's an old personal friend, too. Oh, yes, you were his character witness last year. You paid his legal fees. But why did the studio give him back his job after that scandalous mess? I don't get your point, Patty. Buddy went to jail for 10 months. It's all past and forgotten. It's not forgotten if I choose to revive it. <laughs> Darling, why would you do that? Some of you seem to forget that this place has to keep its skirts clean. This boy steals your car from a studio Christmas party. He drives along half drunk. He wasn't drunk. That was cleared in court. And as my friend, he had a right to borrow my car. The fact remains, he hit and ran. He killed that child in your car. How friendly did you feel when Big Brains here ditched the car on your back lawn and the police walked in that Christmas Eve? All he did, your dear friend, was to almost ruin a career out of the storybooks. I think we can be human enough to forgive that. Jitters and all, didn't he step up and take the blame in time? But I still call it damn poor public relations to give him back his job. Patty, with all the yapping in the world, why would you want to wake this sleeping dog? I'll make you a swap, she says. What about your marriage? And Charlie cuts the conversation by saying, no, Hubbard, that cupboard is bare. And she says, that's your answer, Chuck? And so Mary and his wife comes in, who was supposed to be at the beach. She comes in, and uh, Patty Benedict puts the question to her. Are you and Charlie really separated? Do you sleep in separate beds now that you're separated? And Marion says, in no uncertain terms, mind your own business. I'm the only one in town who's not afraid to tell you to mind your own business. And Patty leaves in a huff, and... Uh, Charlie and Buddy are scrambling to walk her out to her car. So in that little scene, we learn a lot about who Charlie was and who he is now. And um, when he comes back, he has a little scene with his wife. And we learn more about those two things, those two questions. So he says to Marion when he comes back, tell me, Angel, what the hell did you think you were doing? She says, I'll tell her lots more if she plays Lady Pry again. I'm in the movie business, darling. I can't afford these acute attacks of integrity. Why don't you talk to me the way you talk to her? How do I talk to her? Your mouth is liquid honey. I'm insincere with her. Husband, dear, be insincere with me. And he says, would you use your brain, darling? Free speech is the highest priced luxury in this country today. Patty's got 18 million readers. Why antagonize her? Where's the sense? And she says, from time to time, I believe in being completely senseless. I'm a human being, a woman, not a diplomat. Doesn't it make you blench to say, God bless, to Patty Benedict? But of course, you're not sincere. So the argument continues. Now, this, this issue of the contract, because she's threatened to leave Charlie if he signs this contract that's due for renewal, but it's a contract for 14 years. She doesn't want him 
to sign this contract be because she knows what it's done to him and to her and to their marriage. Um, so she keeps bringing that up as much as he's trying to evade that point. Although he's trying to get her back because they're separated. She's living at the beach. He's living at the house. He's trying to get her back because he does love her. And so she says to him, What about the contract? She says, um, he says, Marion, in the whole world, I care about only three and a half people. You, little Billy, Hank Teagle, and the half a man that's me. Marion, be as brutally frank as you like. Why don't you come back? I can change. I know I can make you happy. And she says, how, darling? How can you change in the 12th year of this fantastic career? Why did I leave you once before? Why don't I come back this time? Because a man, darling, can live only two ways, either married or like a bachelor. But all you want, Charlie, is the best features of both. He says, Marion, you don't think that those occasional girls, uh, she says, oh, yes, I do think those occasional girls. Surprised? Charlie Cass was a wonder, and I was Mrs. Cass. Now you're Hoff's Mr. Castle. He says, sorry, sweet, I don't buy that. I don't belong to Marcus Hoff. And she says, what about the contract? So she won't let up on that. And she says, Charlie, I want you to believe me. I won't come back if you sign the contract. He says, I never expected to see the day when a three and a half million dollar deal would give you chills and fever. And she says, neither did I. I'm as human as the next one. It's a fabulous deal, but I but it's for 14 years, and I don't believe in the life that goes with it. Charlie, you're half asleep right now. I haven't seen you sparkle since the day Billy was born. You used to take sides. Golly, the zest with which you fought. You used to grab your theater parts and eat them like a tiger. Now you act with droopy eyes. They have to call you away from a card game. Charlie, I don't want you to sign that contract. You've given the studio their pound of flesh. You don't owe them anything. We arrived here in a pumpkin coach, and we can damn well leave the same way. He says, pulled by a flock of mice. Please. I'm Hoff Federated's biggest star. I'm worth millions a year to them in ice-cold profits. Hoff's got me by the tail, and he won't let go, and you know why. She, she says, tell him you're leaving Hollywood for good. Promise him never to make pictures for anyone else. He says, just what do you expect me to do? Pick up without a backward glance, and what? Go back and act in shows? She says, what's wrong with shows? You started in the theater. We'd go back to New York, yes. The theater still can give you a reasonable living. And away from this atmosphere of flattery and deceit, we might make our marriage work. He says, the theater's a stunted, bleeding stump. Even stars have to wait years for one decent play. And she says, but here, of course, they plan your future, don't they? They buy books out here, idiot's tales. From dividend to dividend, they don't waste your talents for a minute. In your last ten pictures, you were electrocuted four times. <laughs> and Charlie says, Listen, monkey, I know I'm a mechanical capering mouse, but Charlie Cass is still around in dribs and drabs. Don't you think I want our marriage to work? Don't you think I'd like to do a fine play every other year? But I have to face one horny fact. I'm Hoff's prisoner now, and signing the contract is the ransom fee. I didn't have the nerve that night in this room. I made the wrong decision. And she says, come here, Charlie, hold my hands. God help me, I often wish you'd lost your nose and ears in the war. Then the other women wouldn't want you, and I'd have you all to myself. I know you deeply, darling. I've had you with my morning coffee. I know the sleepless nights you've had since Christmas Eve. Look at me, darling. We both made a mistake that night in this room. He says, you could have pushed me the other way that night. She says, you needed sympathy. I wasn't strong enough. It was a difficult choice that night. We failed together, but now we have a second chance. It's a gamble. I know what Hoff can do if you refuse. He says, you sure you know what he can do? She says, yes, but that's the chance we have to take. We may lose everything we own. This time we have to make the right decision together. 
Marion, is that what you want me to do? Yes. I know I'm talking about our lives and your fabulous career, but if you sign, you sink in even deeper than before. Refuse to sign, Charlie. He says, all right, I'll try. I haven't agreed to sign. I've been stalling them for months. So, we're still in Act One. We know where Charlie has come from, the theater. An idealistic young actor doing theater in New York comes out here to Hollywood and meets all the press and they're all trying to get this new actor to talk about himself and all he wants to talk about is FDR. He's naive, like they're interested in his, politi his political point of view. Which is why Patty says all you wanted to talk about was FDR. Um, that's who he was. And now after 12 years, we see what's become of him, who he is now. So he's promised to not sign the contract. But now he has to deal with Marcus Hoff, the head of the studio, which is a little bit like dealing with King Kong, um, hugely powerful, very uh, persuasive man. And plus he has a blackmailing, he's got, he's got this incident that happened where he saved Charlie's ass. He arranged for Buddy to take Charlie's place, so Charlie wouldn't have to go to jail. But now Charlie has to ask him to let him out of the contract. So Marcus Hoff comes over, and they've been arguing and Charlie says, Marcus, I want you to let me go. We don't like each other, I know. But I'll promise you anything to let me go. Hoff says, I solemnly adjure realism, Charlie. I need your physical presence on the lot, your body, not your goodwill. I want you to sign these papers with one of the pens that ended the last war. It was used by a great American, General MacArthur. Charlie says, Marcus, I don't give one good goddamn for anything you've said here today. I love Marion, and I don't intend to lose her if I can help it. Hoff says, Charlie, I can't tell you how many long months of constructive dreaming are in this moment, and I will let nothing or no one stand in the way of that dream. Marcus, I'm asking for the last time. Let me go. And Hoff says, I can't force you to sign. But now Charlie has to make that, he's come to this point in his life. Does he have the guts to say, all right, and get your ass out of here, I'm not gonna sign it. Take the contract with you. It's the crucial moment. And all those years of living easy and getting fat Morally, taking the easy way out, all these compromises, letting his buddy take the rap for him, are now coming to haunt him. He doesn't have the strength. He signs the contract for 14 more years. And after the last signature, he says, Charlie says, I'll keep this pen. It's my only proof that the war is over, or even that it was fought. That's Captain Castle talking. And Hoff says, Charlie, we all love you. You're a peculiar duck, but in a free country, that's your right. <laughs> so, Charlie has signed for 14 more years, and obviously he's going to lose his wife because of it. So Hoff leaves, along with Carl Rove and his agent, <laughs> and... Um, Charlie's left alone. He's been drinking steadily throughout this, the beginning of the place, drinking steadily. And now he's, he's stewed to the gills. And in walks Buddy's, his, his friend Buddy's wife, who's been trying to get Charlie in bed for quite a while now. And she sees he's drunk. He keeps telling her to go home. He's trying to resist her. 
And finally he says in his drunken stupor, how did you know Marion wasn't at home? She says, why? She's at the beach with headaches. She believes in faithful marriage. And Charlie now is getting sick of this woman. He says, and what do you believe? What the hell? She says, I like to walk up spiral stairs just like in a play. Charlie says, you, I ask you a question. What do you believe in? She says, well, not in gloomy thoughts. In fun, darling, in perfume, in staying young and making love, in goodies of every sort and description. I like snug, draped bedrooms. I go on grieving for the past like a weeping bird. What the hell was Charlie Cass? A hothead with clenched fists and a big yam. He says, he says, there are lots of attractive things about Hollywood. Could Cass guarantee you next week's meals? I never heard you kick about barbecuing four-inch steaks. She says, you're right. There's nothing so habit-forming as money, but that's stupid as justification. And he says, what do I have to justify? Do I have to be in politics to hold my head up? What, making money? Is that the sin? And she says, your sin is living against your own nature. You're denatured. That's your sin. He says, you talk like a fresh, moralistic college kid who took a course. And she says, aren't you the one who wants to, says he wants to live a certain way and do a certain kind of work and then pushes the pie in the face of everything he says? Men like Hoff and Coy have their own integrity. They are what they are. The beetle and the fervid Christian can't be equally corrupted. You can laugh, you can snort, but the critic who called you The Van Gogh of the American theater saw, as I did, that you had a Christian fervor. And now you're nothing, common trash, coursing down to something I don't even recognize. Don't think I ever condoned what you did to Buddy or my part in what you did. But you're helpless. You're sick and unhappy. And I go on trying to help a little, defenseless because you're sick. You feel guilty, and it makes you vicious. You've taken the cheap way out. Your passion of the heart has become passion of the appetites. Despite your best intentions, you're a horror. And every day you make me less a woman and more the rug under your feet. And I won't have it. I won't. I can't. I can't. I can't. Charlie says, take it easy, dear. <laughs> she says, taking it e easy is where the trouble begins. He says, come on now, be yourself. She says, that's another good local remark. Be yourself, which means be just like me. Don't be yourself. And he says, can I get you another drink? <laughs> she says, I don't need another drink. Oh, God, I wish the world would get serious so I could be my superficial self again. So the scene continues, and... In it, she reveals that she has had an abortion. Charlie didn't know she was pregnant. And she was waiting to find out what he was going to do with signing the new contract or not. And when he signed the new contract, she went and had an abortion. And she reveals this in the scene. And Hank Teagle, Charlie's friend, who knows that there's big trouble in the marriage, has, uh, is in love with Marion himself and has asked her to marry her. If the, the marriage with her and Charlie doesn't work out, marry me. Uh, she hasn't given him an answer, but he's come to pick her up. And they leave. But before they leave, Charlie tries so hard, pleading to Marion, his case. And he says... Marion, let me say 10 words. I'm sorry, Marion. Sometimes I rave and rant as if I had something against you, but you've only been good to me. It's all a bleak and bitter dream, a real dish of doves. The only friends I can keep are the classy pimps like Coy. There's only two ways to forget everything, get drunk or stick a pencil in your eye. Marion says, I'll see the lawyer in the morning. He says, right. And then he says, but I swear I'm innocent, Marion. I swear that while I'm charming the world with my light fantastic, I'm bleeding to death under my shirt. 
Can't you wait, sweetheart, with the lawyer? Am I the worst oaf in the world? And she says, the world's a big place, but you're the worst oaf in my life. Good night. And she walks off, walks away. Seemingly, the end of their marriage is assured. So now he's lost his wife. And then in comes Carl Rove, whose real name is Smiley Coy in the play. Um, Smiley Coy shows up and he tells Charlie that things are getting out of hand with that starlet that he, that he was with uh, the night of the accident where he ki when he killed the, the little child. The, uh, the starlet, uh, her name is Dixie Evans, was able to wrangle a contract out of the studio because she was there, just happened to be there. And she says, okay, I won't say anything. Just give me a contract. Um, so they give her the contract and she's, uh, but now she's dissatisfied with the roles that she's been uh, given to play in the, in the movies. So now she's hinting that maybe she'll just, you know, tell the truth about wh what really happened that night. And Carl Rove, Smiley Coy, comes in <laughs> and uh, he has a scene with Charlie where he says, look, this is getting out of hand. You've got to get Dixie Evans over here and get her to shut her mouth or else we're going to have to kill her. We're going to have to remove her, he says. And Charlie says, oh, come on, I, I can talk to her, just relax. So he invites Dixie Evans over. And in the course of the scene, he tries to convince her to, to leave L.A., to leave Hollywood, because she's in danger. And um, she doesn't take his, his advice, his warning. She says, I hate those studio bastards. I'm going to make them sweat and kiss my feet. And so just at the end of their little scene, Dixie and, and Charlie's scene, Marion comes back after she had walked off that it's the same night. Marion comes back and she catches him with this starlet in their, in their room. And, uh, and, and, and um, Dixie runs off swearing that uh, she's not going to, you know, she's not going to leave. So Marion and Charlie are left alone. And now Charlie can't persuade Marion to believe that he was trying to, he can't tell her, look, this is the starlet that I was having an affair with the night of the accident. Uh, she doesn't know that. So he, he's trying to convince her, no, we were just talking. I, I was getting ready to go to bed. A certain matter came up. She's just, it, it's nothing. But she doesn't believe him. So Char Charlie now has finally had it with Marion because the wonderful thing about Odette's is that nobody in this play, nobody in this play is noble or without huge flaws. And Marion is, is the same way no different than anybody else in the play. So Charlie now decides to confront her. And it's at the end of this second act. And he says to her, let me talk. Don't push me back to my usual position of self-justification. We'll throw away for the moment the rotten bunch of grapes that's me. Although I must say your judgment's gone. You swat the fly on my nose with a hammer. But your big trouble, my spouse, for all your talk, the merchant psychology of the country is in your blood, too. You bargain and trifle with your own nature. That's something my Uncle Al never did. I learned that from him. Well, that's yesterday. But tonight, you're about to possibly destroy your whole life and maybe mine by bargaining with your nature because the object you serve is blemished. Didn't we pick each other out of millions? Can that be bargained away by saying, like a merchant, that Marion will be herself and love Charlie only if he meets a certain price and conditions? With all your talk, girl, why are you willfully denaturing yourself? Why? Because my integrity is impaired? Because I'm coarsened and listless, dull and burdened? But I struggle. I try to live. Don't you see me struggle and resist? 
I may die in a fight in the street, but what about you with your shopkeeper's bargains? Where's the rich, full-hearted woman I know you to be? I tell you, I say to hell with bargaining. Down with public opinion. Down with not being what we are. To hell with merchants and their tricks. Marion, I need you. I love you. I promise you understanding and devotion. Anything I can do. Listen, if I lose you, cross your fingers if you go. In fact, pray for me. But if you stay, if I'm right, I exact conditions that you fight me back if I'm wrong, that you stop reaching for the doorknob, and not the least of these conditions is silence. Because we need silence, all of us. Oh, darling, how we need silence and thought in this noisy, grabbing world. And she says, you can talk. How you can talk when you're Charlie Cass. She says, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I'll sleep in my own room. Charlie says, thanks. And thanks. So she goes up the stairs and she stops and she says, do me a favor, Charlie. I beg of you. Grow up. Before it's too late. End of the act. So by the end of the act, she's come back. But you're really getting a sense, beautifully written by Clifford Odets, of this journey, these traumatic blows that Charlie is, is receiving and how it's affecting him, who he was and who he is now. So now he's got his wife back. But there's still the Dixie problem. It's only swept un under the rug temporarily, this problem. He has a scene with his agent, and he, he uh, this is in Act 3 now, the last act. He tells his agent, you know, Marion and I have decided to go on a second honeymoon cruise. So the marriage is seemingly back in pretty good shape. But he gets a visit from his friend, Hank Teagle, the one who who's the writer, who's his best friend, who asked Marion to marry him. If their marriage didn't work out, maybe you'd like to marry me. <laughs> and in this scene, Charlie has a couple of revelations that start his, his realization of who he is, because he's been evading it. He hasn't been willing to face himself. And he's got to get to that point in the third act that I mentioned early on, where he says, now I realize what I am. So this scene with Hank helps him to get there. Hank says, how's Marion? I think she's shopping. She phoned me yesterday about your reconciliation. Do I hear you offer congratulations? Do I read in the paper that you've signed a contract for 14 years? Yes. The Irishman is right. Happiness is no laughing matter. Charlie says, I want you to know that Marion is very happy. Hank says, that remains to be seen. Oh, you know better? Hank says, I know that Marion stands in your life for your idealism and that you've wounded her and it. Charlie says, when are you leaving, Hank? In the morning. Maybe I should stay out here and make a fortune building a toll tunnel from the studios to the racetracks. <laughs> Charlie says, will the new book be one of your real things? Hank says, I still try to write out of Pascal's remark. I admire most those writers who tell with tears in their eyes what men do to other men. This book is about a man like you. Huh, that's a fine, fat subject, but it doesn't smell very average. How could a man become a popular movie star without reflecting the average in one way or another? And it's really about a guy like me. It's a fable about moral values and success. 
<laughs> you think Marion won't be happy here, don't you? You won't like my answer. Say it. And Hank says, yes. I came here to say goodbye, but I'm too old to be abject. Marion's future interests me deeply. No, I don't think she'll be happy here with you. I don't want Marion joining the lonely, junked people of our world, millions of them, wasted by the dreams of the life they were promised and the swill they received. They are why the whole world, including us, sits bang in the middle of a revolution. Here, of course, that platitude carries with it the breath of treason. I think lots of us are in for a big shot of vitamin D. Defeat, decay, depression, and despair. Pardon my deust. And Charlie says, you're eloquent, I give you that, but I don't agree. <laughs> Hank says, good enough, don't agree. Why should you? You're not the man you used to be. I'm not. No. You've sold out. You'll be here for another 14 years. Stop torturing yourself, Charlie. Don't resist. Your wild native idealism is a fatal flaw in the context of your life out here. Half idealism is the peritonitis of the soul. America is full of it. Give up and really march to Hoff's bugle call. Forget what you used to be. That's the only way you'll find a reasonable happiness and pass it on to your wife. No half man ever made a woman happy. And uh, Charlie says, and what are you? A whole man, toots? No, I'm toots. A crippled man who needs Marion to help him fight. You won't get her, Hank. Will you hold her? How? I'll read your book and find out how. You go to hell in the book. Charlie says, And do you say in your book it isn't even easy to go to hell today? That there's nothing left to sin against? Correction. There's health left to sin against. Health. The last nervous conviction of the time. We're sick at heart, but we'll increase the lifespan. What for? Nobody knows. You're right, Hank. Your hero's half a man, neither here nor there. Dead from the gizzard up. Stick him with a pin. And see, no feelings. When I came home from Germany, I saw most of the war dead were here, not in Africa and Italy. And Roosevelt was dead. And the war was only last week's snowball fight. And we plunged ourselves, all of us, into the noble work of making the buck reproduce itself. Oh, those luscious salmon eggs of life. And Hank says, if you feel that deeply, Charlie says, get out of here. Does the man in your book get out of here? Where does he go? What, pray tell, does he do? Become a union organizer? Well, what does he do? Hank says, Charlie, I can't invent last act, in, last act curtains for a world that doesn't have one. You're still an artist, Charlie. And Charlie just looks at him because he knows he's not an artist anymore. Last ten pictures, he was electrocuted four times. He just signed on for 14 more years of those same kind of pictures. He knows he's not an artist. Huge revelation. And he walks away from Hank and he says, I'll miss you, Hank. Write your book. Make it scandalous. Wire me for money anytime you need it. Someone has to complete the work he was born to do. Naive, ain't it? And Hank says, yes but it's one of your best qualities. Charlie says, you showed me the rough side of your tongue and I love you for it. Why don't you stay here, Hank? Be my Horatio. Isn't that a laugh? Hank says, 
You have Marion. And Charlie says, if she's strong enough, I don't want to hurt her again. She's frail. Women are really frails, aren't they? And yet, she's the iron hoop that holds my rotten staves together. And he breaks down. Hank puts his arms around him and says, if you wrestle, Charlie, you may win a blessing. And Charlie says, Stand back now, Hank. I don't want to see your face again. You're a man with too much courage. Revolution. Art. The words you use above ground. Goodbye, Hank. Hank says, give my love to Marion. Charlie says, goodbye, bozo. And just before Hank gets to the door, he turns around and he says, you rewarded my last visit. You still know that the failure is the best of American life. And Charlie says, yes. So his best friend leaves. And uh, Charlie's left alone when Carl Rove makes another appearance. Because the situation is getting more and more out of hand. Dixie Evans is getting drunk in a bar and she's threatening right now to go out to the press and tell the real story of what happened that night with Charlie Castle because she was there. And Smiley Coy tells Charlie, you've got to go to that bar, get her out of there, take her home, feed her drinks. And Charlie says, well, what if she doesn't drink? He says, make sure she does. He says, uh, Smiley Coy says, make sure she, she does. The, the, the liquor is doctored. So when she passes out, you leave and leave the rest of it to us. We'll take care of it. So now Charlie has to face himself again. What's he going to do? Is he going to go along with it? Be an accomplice to murder? Involuntary manslaughter is one thing. Accomplice to murder is another. Well, I'm very proud to say that Charlie doesn't go along with it. Um, made me very happy the first time I read this play. <laughs> he tells Smiley Coy to get Marcus Hoff over here. He gets his agent over there, and they're going to have a big meeting and a big confrontation about this whole thing. And they do. And in the course of that confrontation, Charlie gets so fed up with Marcus Hoff that he slaps him right across the face. Actually, in, in our production, I hit him over the head with these records that he had made of because the course of the conversation was that Marcus Hoff was saying, why are you being loyal to this woman, your wife? We have, con we have records of conversations between her and Hank Teagle in his office and on his couch. And Charlie says, well, where's the proof? Carl Rove goes out to the car to, to get the, uh, the records. And Charlie knows that uh, his wife and Hank Teagle have been meeting having conversations in his in Tank Teagle's office at the studio. Um, but that's when Charlie takes the records <clears throat> in our production, and I slapped him a couple times very hard with those records, broke the records. And Hoff says to him, I'll break you, I'll break you. You have pissed away a kingdom today. And Charlie's left alone with his wife and his agent after Hoff leaves and Smiley Coy, Charlie says, now I realize what I am. I owe you the deepest apology, Nat, his agent. 
for dragging you into this filth, but I can't go on carrying a musket for Hoff, being his boy. Nat says, wait a minute, lovey, first things first. I'll tell you, why don't I take, take it on my own prerogative to take Miss Dixie Evans home with me and out of my own pocket, I'll offer her a $10,000 bill. Charlie says, you're sweet, darling, but it's too late from my point of view. I can't go on covering one crime with another. That's Macbeth. Nat says, but not to rehash an old wound. You didn't commit any crime. You're a good boy. I know you're a good boy. And Charlie says, but Macbeth is an allegory, too. One by one, he kills his better selves. And he says, why am I surprised by them? Isn't every human being a mechanism to them? Don't they slowly, inch by inch, murder everyone they use? Don't they murder the highest dreams and hopes of a whole great nation with the movies they make? This whole movie thing is a murder of the people. Only we hit them on the heads, under the hair. Nobody sees the marks. So Nat leaves. Charlie's left alone with his wife. They're running through the options of what they can do. And Charlie has a breakdown, finally. He goes down to his knees and he says, Marion, help me, help me. Hold me tight. She says, I'll help you, Charlie, I'll help. He says, I can't give myself up, I can't. She says, quiet, quiet. He says, Hank is right, I mustn't resist. I must make peace here or go out of my mind. I'm caught. Hoff's prisoner. He gave me an appetizing name, and now he thinks he'll eat me. My life is sworn away, and now they want a murder for me, and I see what I am. She says, you be quiet now. I still have Charlie Cass. And then the great realization. And he says, oh, no. No. And then the phone rings. He picks it up, and it's Buddy, his friend. And Buddy has a conversation with him. And Charlie hangs up the phone, and he now has to tell Marion what the conversation was about. And he says, Connie came home last night, drunk. They had a fight. She's leaving Buddy. She brought my name in. So now she knows that not only was he sleeping with that starlet the night of the accident, he's recently gone to bed with Connie, his best friend's wife. She turns away with him in absolute disgust. And Charlie says to her, Look at me. Can you face it? Look at this dripping fat of the land. Could you ever know that all my life I yearned for a world and people to bring out the best in me? How can life be so empty? But it can't be. It can't. It's proven. Statistics and graphs prove it. We are the world's happiest, Earth's best. She still hasn't turned around to face him, and that's what he's waiting for. She hasn't done that. He says, I'll go up and bathe and change my clothes. He's waiting for her to turn around as he walks up the stairs, and he stops. And she still hasn't turned around to face him, and he says, Marion, Everything that embitters you, I pledge you a better future. It begins tonight. And he walks away from her. But she hasn't heard him walk away. And she says, without knowing that he's not there, she says, I'm committed to you. 
I love you. We won't talk about the past. And she turns around. He's not there. He didn't hear it. So now he's in his bathroom, staring himself in the mirror, realizing, as he said in that line, now I realize what I am. And he cuts himself in three places, three places and bleeds to death. Uplifting? I didn't get it. I wasn't uplifted. That's not a tragedy. <laughs> That's not a tragedy. Everybody was so... Couldn't you have found a better way to do it, deal with that problem? <laughs> but as Lynn said yesterday, tragedy happens. Tragedy happens. But there is hope. Because Smiley Coy comes in, finds Charlie dead, goes to the phone, gets everything ready for all the reporters that are, that are going to be bes uh, besieging the house. And Hank comes in, Hank's old friend, I mean, Charlie's old friend. And Marion, of course, is absolutely distraught. But Coy says, help her, Horatio. She doesn't like me. Tell her the reporters, loads of them, any minute. Hank says, I'll talk to the reporters. And Coy says, that won't be necessary. We'll be here. Hank says, that's why it's necessary. Coy says, listen, fella. This is no time to get contentious. The photographers, Hank says, there will be no photographers. There will be no lies, no display. This is my friend's hour, not the nation's, not Hoff's. Your work is finished here. It won't be smooth, but I'll tell the story. He killed himself because that was the only way he could live. You don't recognize a final, a final act of faith when you see one. And Marion breaks down and says, Charlie, help, help, help. The lights fade, the end of the play. So the audience goes home. And now that you, you know something a little bit more about Clifford Odets, I think it's very clear that embedded in this play was that question, who, who, to every one of those audience members, and in the larger sense, the nation, who are you really? Who will you become? And then the even the bigger the biggest question, the most the one that's meant to startle you out of your sleep at night and not let you sleep the way it was startling Charlie Cass. Who, if not you? All those billions of morning doves asking that question to you individually and to our country, who? Who, 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 if not you? Thank you.